I want to take a moment to introduce our uh, first inaugural ETS Thought Leader of the Year. And this came after we had uh, Sorry, reviewed and had a selection committee review the 175 speakers that spoke at Energy Thought Summit uh, webinars, uh, events, uh, and pro provided content on a range of fields. Congratulations. This year, the person that we selected, self-evidently, fundamentally exceptional at what he does. Dr. Masood Amin, he's the chairman of the IEEE Smart Grid Group. He's the chairman, board of directors for Texas's reliability entity. Uh, the group that oversees ERCOT, as well as the board directors of the Midwest uh, Reliability Organization. On top of that, he is the, uh, I want to say, the dean and chair of the Computer and Electrical Engineering Program at the University of Minnesota. He's also the executive director of the Technology Leadership Institute. He is working with the White House Critical uh, Infrastructure Task Force on solving the most significant resilience and infrastructure challenge that we face today. There's no better person for our thought leader of the year than Dr. Masood Amin. Doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much for your generous introduction. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Good afternoon. After such a generous introduction, the best thing I can do is to say thank you and sit down. <laughs> because everything else I share with you is going to be let down from that point. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> In the next 20 hours, I'm going to share with you <laughs> 2020 outlook. No, seriously. In the next 30 minutes, hopefully no more than that. Last year, how many colleagues were at ETS 14 on March 14th of last year? All right. Excellent. So you saw, I shared with you last year on the technology push, on what opportunities can be afforded to us by judicious use of technology. This year, I'm going to completely switch, look at the other side. Look at the framework that is new, has been going on for a long time, about 20 years, even as far back as 1965 blackout, oh, yeah. when use of computers hey, and automation. Sorry? Do we have a hacker? <laughs> or haggler? Come on up. <laughs> Come on up. Join the crowd. So, no, we are in Austin. Let's keep things weird. <laughs> in Minnesota, we are more Norwegian, Swedish. We are very polite. We are very proper. So anybody who misbehaves is going to be flattened. <laughs> Joking aside, Today, I'm going to share with you the other side of the coin. What's the framework? What are the key challenges, disruptive challenges, that our industry, our broader community has been going through? And rather than answering the question, pick your brain on what we can do together. So it's not so much of telling you as a professor what it is, but I'm at your service to discuss some pressing issues that we have to deal with in order to advance progress. How does that sound? So no answers, but framework and some key questions that are common. If we handle them, I think we will have more than a resilient, secure, green, more efficient system infrastructure. And in addition to that, we create jobs and grow our economy by about $6 per every dollar spent on the innovations we are talking about. But it's going to require supportive public policy at every level, from local level to the federal level, as well as business models, new business models. So does that sound OK? So the key word is disruption. How many of you have believe or have seen, have lived through the last five, seven years of that disruptive force in our industry, or disruptive forces? If you haven't lived in it, you will be very soon when you get deeper and deeper into the, the areas that Doyle spoke about last night, this morning at Internet of Things, and Dr. Metcalf talked about that in his presentation. So some of the drivers of that, I'm going to give you the top 10. Since everybody has a top 10 list, 
I try to narrow it down to top 10. If you're interested more in this area, I wrote an article for Public Utility Fortnightly that just came out this month, part two of that is coming out next month, and it's available on the net. The efficiency and energy intensity dropping about 2% a year. You saw load growth is about 0.9% a year. Last year, I shared with you that uh, data centers with all the video streaming, all the archiving, digital archiving we are doing, and all the smart devices we are using is doubling in terms of load on the system every five years. By 2030, data centers at the rate we are going conservatively will be 20% of total demand in the United States. Distributed generation, DG, distributed energy resources, including storage and microgrids, which I'm going to talk about. More and more cities are interested in controlling their future. As an example, Rochester, and this is nothing new, Rochester, Minnesota, many years ago, decided to have its own utility, and they created their own utility. Last few years, there was a discussion to, for Minneapolis to separate from Excel, formerly Northern States Power, and has its own microgrid. But it wasn't cost effective. It would add another layer of infrastructure cost, organization would complicate things even more. And fortunately, that didn't happen. But that's the trend, and it also gets into smart cities and Internet of Things, the trend that is convergent with other forces that are taking place. District energy system, you're going to see combined heat and gas, power, chilling, smart grid that is dear to our heart. And then the electric transportation, more and more. You have seen the Teslas that are uh, nicely displayed. Many of you also have seen EPA's regulations, including the limit on carbon, and many utilities are struggling how to meet that demand response, and many third-party aggregation aggregators that are getting into it, some of them, who controls the data, who owns the data, and so on. And then CHP plus waste recovery, and finally, interstate and even transnational nature of utilities. And as part of that, contractors. And I'm not going to talk too much about one of my key areas of work, which is security, cyber physical security, but that leads to security concerns. Target, uh, as you know, it was a vendor for the HVAC system. That through that vulnerability, they got into the system and stole the credit card information and personal information. For us in the utilities, our contractors more and more are increasingly are connected globally. So what are the key, based on those drivers, what are the key questions? You read the EEI death spiral that had predicted demise of the current utilities, incumbent utilities. I don't think all, any of it is by itself sufficient. We need to look at the biggest macro environment and the need for change the need for adaptability and integration of new technologies, new workforce, new capabilities that you have heard throughout this conference and also last year. There are business models that uh, are emerging and how will they successfully serve both the upstream as well as the market sector, electricity market sectors? What effects could they have on the new business models, on the incumbent utilities? What, what organizations may exist and emerge? How will regulation need to evolve to do this? So when you look at this, we have mapped out plausible scenarios. And each of the scenarios has drivers, have risk, have probabilities, have possibilities, even uh, uh, non-deterministic, but subjective, if you will, weights on them. If you're interested, I'd be happy to share that with you. You can look at my articles in Electricity Today, last month on public utility for nightly, this month and next month we go through that. And I will be happy to talk to you offline. So then what do we do also for critical infrastructure protection, for resilience, for security, for not only utility side, but privacy for the consumer side? Today. According to a colleague we served on a panel last summer together from ComEd, CEO of ComEd, our framework is locked us in a 20th century infrastructure. And that probably is the biggest glitch. On behalf of IEEE, 
Dr. Damir Novosel, Dr. Veronica Rabel led a group from IEEE, across IEEE, and we prepared a quadrennial energy review report that is, we submitted to the Department of Energy last summer for the White House. If you're interested, I have some references in it. My presentation also will be available on the web. I'm very grateful, by the way, to Mark, to Jason, to Andres, to so many great, to the president, our newly appointed president of the organization, for the terrific work you have done in Z Prime as well as on ETS. I was going to do it at the end or later this evening, but allow me to start hinting at that right now. Thank you, and the presentation will be posted. You will have it shortly after this is over. So no need to take pictures or notes. So that's the biggest challenge. And what can we do in the QER? We highlight what practical steps can be taken. I wrote chapter four on aging asset, asset management, security, and modernization of the infrastructure. There are other chapters on microgrids, on electric transportation, on metrics for smart grid that I highly recommend in that same QER report, and it's available to you. Talking about regulation, what Anne and many of us, how many of you are in the regulation side of things, on the policy side of things, or legal side. A couple of my colleagues from Texas Reliability are here. Our general counsel, I like to shout out, is here, and several other people. This is a huge area. And every state, pretty much, uh, that you see here highlighted has something going on in this, in this area. Uh, Texas, maybe also Texas and Hawaii, maybe bellwether states with things coming. It's not clear yet, but I think based on what I'm hearing, what I'm reading on the tea leaves, those may be coming also in the near future. So you look at the other part, uh, policies on smart grid, the regulatory proceedings are highlighted in blue, governor's initiative in green, that you're seeing that in Connecticut, and uh, you're seeing a utility 2.0 initiative, and in yellow is potential regulatory change that's going to take place. These are, you have, of course, seen, or many of you have worked on New York and California DR planning, and Texas and Hawaii are also coming, most likely. I'm grateful to Eric Gunther at Enernex, founder of it and CTO. He shared the update as part of IEEE Smart Grid on what's going on. And what's pretty much all the utilities you're seeing here have some level of what they call utility of the future initiatives. What are you, how many of you are involved in these initiatives? Anybody? How many of you are hoping to contract with them, to work with them to make it real? Good, excellent. So step back further, that gives you the macro environment. When we look at the disruptive technologies, I talked about policy changes that are coming, not on the technology side, Look at what, uh, and this is not new, you look at McKenzie reports, look at the kinds of things that according to McKenzie, and I happen to teach a course on pivotal emerging technologies to executives every year and update that, but many of these impact us, not just energy storage or cloud technology or automation or internet of things, we are at the core, not only energizing it, providing power, but we are also customers of it these technologies. So there's bi-directional dependencies. Allow me to switch to a, present, to a simulation from a few years ago, and I ask you, when do you think that came up? So would you please switch to that simulation if possible? This is the current one today. And uh, you see what's actually, this is the future. Sorry, would you please go to today, click on the top exactly. This is today's business model on top of this and regulation. What do you see there? Boil water, make steam, use AC transmission network, send it down through substations <laughs> to residential, commercial, and um, uh, industrial customers, and the old, good old mechanical meters, which is being replaced, is changing that. This model has been on since Tesla. Uh, but with a lot of modifications in the 60s, 70s, automation, 80s, industry has done a nice job, but it's only part of the way. Would you pre please switch to the next one, the future? And would you please click on the bottom of the screen on the, on the commercial sector? 
double click. So we talk about smart cities automation. How old do you think this simulation is? Nineteen ninety-nine. When I started the area of complex interactive networks at EPRI and smart grid was umbrella, self-healing grid, the over about seven of the technologies out of twenty-four we extracted, we prepared this, and those of you who were involved later on on IntelliGrid, we used that. So this is 16 years old. Have we gotten there yet? What is stopping us? Is there a value in doing this? What's the value proposition? Would you please back up on the bottom of the screen, the top view, and click on industrial sector. Talk about what Andres mentioned this morning, having autonomous systems that self-correct, that self-heal, self-optimize with minimum human supervision so that we can free up the time to do higher IQ work that workers need. Would you please go back and do I can go through every one of these. Go back and talk about something that now we call transactive energy, prices. Would you please click on the bottom that says next and look at the residential. So the car provides electricity and is charging depending on the price signal, when that is. So this is 16 years old. Not to brag about it, but we haven't moved the bar as sufficiently as we can. We can do a lot better than this. So don't you agree? So let's work on common areas that we can together advance that progress. What are those common areas? Would you please go back? Oh, by the way, the, this, the green circles are smart sensors that have actuation also built in. The, we can go through them. There, there are the refurbished intelligent electronic devices, both with intelligent agent function and actuation locally. So it's electric sensors that monitor health of devices, monitors precursors. To, this was even before 9-11. On 9-11, we took a lot of these technologies at EPRI and we moved it to monitoring, overlay to monitor not only situational awareness, but actionable intelligence. Getting thousands of data streams, analyzing them in near real time and knowing what signatures are. There are many companies in the room who are today working on it. So what's stopping us from success? What's preventing us from 2020 vision or 2030 vision? That's the one I want to really for us to focus on. So would you please go back to the PowerPoint presentation, the overlay. My apologies for the transition. We have a wonderful colleague in the back who is doing it and I'm grateful. Otherwise I would be here trying to fiddle with it and messing it up. So this is what we want to do. Put an overlay of sensors, communication with security built in to do what? To increase the efficiency, increase resilience, increase real-time situational awareness and close the loop on actionable intelligence and provide business value. Create jobs, grow economies. That's all we want to do. Simple, right? Sounds simple, but as you notice, we are all working on it and we are still long way to go. This is not new. The two gentlemen, Thomas Edison and Tesla, Nikola Tesla, this is, should be well known to everybody. I covered it last year. I've been covering this subject since 98. The greatest achievement of engineering in the last century was the North American electric power grid. The question is, is it going to be a relic of the 21st century or are we going to upgrade it, modernize it and achieve the kind of performance and powering our economy that we know it can be. So this is important. If you forget everything else I presented, I hope you remember the simulation. Vision is the same as what we call now Internet of Things, I call it complex interactive networks. Smart cities is just enabled by that, and self-healing smart grid. They're all really coupled together. And it's not just this infrastructure, it's water supply, 
Transportation is the underpinning of interdependencies between these systems and IT network and sensors that are like the nervous system connecting them. So I think the power grids have come full circle. Thomas Edison and Tesla, now is the time to merge them together, finally, after more than 120 years. DC systems that Thomas Edison was pushing for are entirely not possible. You hear HVDC implementation of that and so on. Mini grids or micro grids, uh, HVAC, H, uh, sorry, HVDC, HVDC at various and islandable micro grids. These are all now being done, finally, at a, at a pace that I think is going to pick up drastically in the next five years. So keep an eye for these and for some areas that we are going to cover, you are going to hear in this conference, including storage. So this is specifically, I prepared this for ETS. Think about scenarios planning. And this is the, the tip of the iceberg. Historically, we have operated in the top right-hand corner. That everything is centralized, few sources, many of them are far away. And that was the, the, the basis for uh, national security and economic security because we depended uh, on sources far away or across nations. On the other side of the spectrum are everything local, everything microgrid, Thomas Edison's original dream. And in between, there is a hybridization. So if you map it out on a scenario planning, the diffusion of technology, business model, policy that is conducive of this transformation are areas that we are focusing on. And the drivers that I shared with you, the 10 drivers and the five questions that we posed, all are captured within this picture. So in the next five years, expect to see a lot more decentralization. That's a global trend. Countries like China and so on, I just came back from Vietnam and China, they still need the backbone. But they're moving massively uh, uh, in gold wind and other areas into the integration of centralized wind and centralized solar into their grid. For us, it's mostly on the distribution side. But we are going to see a lot more need for regional partnerships. So organizations such as ERCOT, MISO, Texas RE, Midwest Reliability Organization will be great partners to, to make sure that we're moving forward in a reliable way as we do this change. And also, all of these require business assessment. And this is the great part that you only take action when you can justify it that this is going to make you money, or at least reduce pain. You either what? Make money or reduce pain, right? Good news is, if we do it judiciously, we can do both. So what are the challenges? Large-scale integration of renewables, storage, distributed generation, plug-in vehicles. These are all not news to you. You have seen them. So we need also, now you're seeing more and more not synchronized phasor measurement at the, gener at the high voltage, but you're seeing micro PMUs at the distribution side. You're seeing sensors, the same level of automation, measuring the system 20 times, 50 times a second so that you can take corrective action before the electrons travel too far. You're seeing that a lot. And also as part of it, security has to be built in. I've advocated it since 98. It cannot be glued on as an afterthought. And I ask vendors, and utilities in the room, please insist on security in the device, including the chips, in the protocols, and in the architecture. And if you're retrofitting, security be included as part of that. It's a lot cheaper, and believe me, if you don't do it, it's going to backfire on all of us. The whole smart grid will collapse if there is a vulnerability. Some vendors who deployed smart meters without security provision undermined it for the whole community. So I hope I'm not being too forceful. I'm a teacher. I'm supposed to get you that that to me was a D minus or an F. You know? So don't be a bad student. Be a good student. It doesn't cost much. It will cost you 50 cents maybe. We were talking about it with a colleague yesterday per meter. Do it. But have smart people at utilities and in your organization who really think about all of these angles. Otherwise, it's going to undermine us, and you don't know who is going to steal what information from whom, or do home invasion, or all kinds of stuff. So these are the things that you have already covered. 
smart appliances, electric vehicles, and so on. The biggest ones that I see coming and are already here for the next five to 10 years are the ones that you're seeing here. These are pivotal. Energy storage, microgrid, cyber physical security, not only NERC standards that are being enforced, but also more and more customers demand how do, you, how do I know I'm secure? How do I know my information is private? Who owns my information? Advanced controls, the operating platforms, and in-home technologies. And you're seeing a lot of them in this conference. These are the five big areas you're seeing. So this is the next generation, 2020 or beyond. It's the part that I've highlighted on the bottom of the screen. This evolution comes from confluence of several things, that is managing demand through customers as part of a well-managed, secure, smarter grid. So whatever it takes to enable that, that's where the gains are. What I have learned in the last 20 years working on this area, and I'm working for the University of Minnesota trying to make our grid uh, campuses smarter, is holistic modeling. When it comes to asset management, also holistic modeling, the end-to-end. -end. Consider all parts, focus on benefits to cost payback, cost recovery, remove deficiencies that are fundamental, whether it's on your communication, whether it's on security overlay, focus on critical foundational areas that if you address, you make it more secure, more efficient, better managed, better operated. Education and research involve universities. We are happening to be in a great university, UT Austin. You have a huge brain power right here to tap into. We saw an ex a distinguished example of it just half an hour ago with the father of the lithium ion battery. Impressive. I mean, it's, for me, it's an honor to follow the same steps to come up here to talk to you so soon after he has called and touches us in, in our minds and hearts. You have so much to gain turn University of Texas Austin into smart grid campus. What retrofitting do you need? What changes do you need in the substation, in the smart buildings to do that? I'd be at your service without pay. I'm happy to do it. I happen to be at Texas Reliability so I cannot get paid by any entity outside of Texas Reliability at Texas. Otherwise, it's a conflict of interest. I'd be happy to help you on that. But these are the kinds of things you can do, and you can engage students, graduate students, even undergraduates. We're going to talk about education tomorrow. There's a terrific panel. We talk about it more. Microgrids are huge, and this is showing you how it is growing, capacity growing every year, and it's actually taken off. You have already seen the cost of renewables dropping. You have seen implementation of microgrids improving. There is caution, though. How many of you are familiar with the, with the integration of solar, distributed solar, into the local distribution systems in Southern California, in Flagstaff, in Japan? What happens? Our old electromechanical devices have a hard time handling that, right? Some of them can burn out. So read John McDonough's article in IEEE Smart Grid Newsletter and use power electronics to control that. So the solution is easy. There is also a policy ramification in there that California has been looking at it and needs. There is a policy change that has to be brought. So it's not just technology, it's also a policy part to that. But it can be addressed. This is important. I, I, I hope I'm not running out of time. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Thank you. So, so look at this. I'm, I'm not sure which way I try to divide my time in half in, in both of them, but let me do it this way. If you look at microgrids, why microgrids are important, in this screen, let me actually go down on this side to show you. If you look at batteries, isolated batteries, or kerosene lamp, they can serve, depends what kind of load you're serving. We can create easily in a, in a warehouse that all you care about is lighting, we can have it self-supporting without being connected to the grid. So depending on what energy service you're looking at, you need different levels of support, different levels of infrastructure. But look at exactly where the cost comes in. 
In Haiti, rural households spend an average of $10 a month for kerosene and candles. I'm picking up on what Doyle talked about last night. It was 3% of our money, of our budget, per month goes to electricity. In Bangladesh, rural families use about half a liter of kerosene every night for lighting. High cost show you that lighting and phone charging services have very high prices. Some of us also use half a gallon of gas to go get a gallon of milk. That doesn't make sense to me. So when you look at these prices, they work out to be about 20 to 40 $5 per kilowatt hour per kerosene lighting on a CFL or LED equivalent basis, and $60 to $115 per kilowatt hour for cell phone charging. So what's the value proposition? If you want all these services, right, what's the best choice for you? What's the cost effective choice? I, I know I should give you a pop quiz. No, seriously, what is? I mean, you look at the prices, and we don't think about price of value of service, and this is critical. What's the value of service? Ends up being microgrids or centralized, right? So in that transition that I shared with you, it's somewhere in the middle. Depending on cost, depending on emissions, depending also on the quality of service we are getting. That's important. Now we move to smart cities to get to the last part of my presentation. In the US right now to have a national policy is nearly impossible. So what do we do? And I've worked on rural villages electrification in Africa and India. So that's sometimes essential, but what's the right scale for us to focus on? That we can get things done. National, of course, we will persist, but it's cities. Cities value, generate the most economic value for, for GDP growth for our economy. And that's where we could focus on. In IEEE Smart Grid, we just had a conference in India, largest ever IEEE conference across IEEE partnership, communication society, controls, power system, computers called Intellect. And we focused on four tracks, H3O, which is smart home, hospital, hotel, and office on microgrids, rural electrification, and renewable integration, smart cities, and humanitarian impact of smart electricity. Very successful, and future is about convergence of all of the technologies and entire ecosystem that we need to worry about. So I urge you, don't focus on just on policy, or on business, or on human capital, or technology. We need all of the above, together, in an integrated way. So when you look at this map, from NASA, this is the GDP of nations. I shared that with you a year ago, where the wealth of nations, or the part that's dark maroon, generates between half a million to about $546 million in terms of uh, per square kilometer in economic output. Guess what on top of it is? What's connected on the internet, internet of things? This is a map of everything connected through the internet. So what powers all this? The electric power networks, right? So coupling of communications, economic growth, and electricity together with environmental modeling, greenhouse gas emissions is the part. Have you ever done this assessment? Yes, I'm not gonna talk about too many of them, just share one of them with you. Uh, in Minneapolis, 27 miles Basically, to the south of Minneapolis, we have Humor Park, World War II, Weapon Factory, just on the way to Rochester, Rochester, Minnesota, which is down here. Let me now switch over here. Rochester is here, United you know for IBM and Mayo Clinic, and the Humor Park is here. This is what it looks like. And the big smokestacks in the back are remnants of the World War II Weapon Factory, that is there. The rest of it looks like an old, beaten up warehouse. We are developing it into a 30,000 sustainable community, residential and commercial. So four of my students who, have, who are all doing their Master of Science in Management of Technology, they work in Medtronic, Honeywell, IBM, elsewhere. We worked on what's the potential for smart city, for smart grid, and for a whole new sustainable community long term. What's the value, what's the, how much do you think when you put this as part of Greenfield built 
Same with security, by the way. How much would it cost to make it smart grid, smart city ready? The cost per home, depending on square footage, was about $10,000 to $28,000. Four to five percent of total cost. The value proposition was more than clear. Cost recovery within 18 months, 19 months, depending what applications they used. I mean, it makes perfect sense. So how do you get in that with the building code, not just lead certification, but get this as part of design? So what else is being connected? Look at all the things that are being connected together. And all of them as part of the smarter part. This is coming. I mean, 2020 vision we talk about, all of it is already here. How many of you have, fel have family members or friends who have pacemaker from Medtronic, St. Jude, or Boston Scientific? How often do they read that from home? Call and connect and do. You read also about vice, former vice president that disconnected his from Wi-Fi because he was worried about that being hacked because of an episode on, on Homeland last year or, or a few years ago. So there are all kinds of stuff that are being connected and they all re depend different levels of quality of service for utilities and for, for homes. This is from Cisco. Number of things that are connected now exceeds number of people connected. So we need to take this huge bowl of spaghetti, Wi-Fi, wired, etc., and try to leverage that in a way that would grow economically. But security again, interoperability becomes huge in all of that. So to fast forward, uh, for just the smart grid, we are going to need to increase the volume of data tenfold of what we can handle in terms of response time primary within milliseconds, so phaser measurement units, synchro phasers, and secondary in the fraction of a second up to a second in order to really reduce the potential large outages or spread of outages. I shared with you what we are doing in my lab. This is one of our projects. We have been doing it since 2003. We can do fast look ahead risk assessment 15 times faster than what's available in the industry. So we can have almost like a game of chess, see what the ellipsoid of our uncertainty is around current trajectories. We can do that not only for watts, but some of it also for prediction of dollars, cost of electricity. Where is it headed? We integrate weather forecasts, we integrate humidity, a lot of factors into it. And the Cray computer that Seymour Cray and alum of my department invented, we are doing that on six, seven NVIDIA boards and, and these boards, by the way, kids use them for gaming. We use them for fast simulation. Very effective. However, data tsunami. Currently, we generate about 70 terabytes of data at an, at an average utility. Depending on what application we put on, that number is going to grow 12, 14 folds. So can we close the loops on this? Can we handle this amount of data? My colleagues from IBM said, Masood, don't worry. We can eat this for breakfast. In utilities, we are not prepared for that. In control centers, we are not prepared for that. So all this nice instrumentation can be leveraged that. And on ramp in San Diego, 50 billion devices need to be networked. And this is from water, from gas, from electricity. Utility has the broader sense together. 50 billion devices. Great opportunity, but unsolved problem. So what's next? We already covered it to conclude, and I talked mostly about North America, but it's a global phenomenon. Uh, and I'm not going to talk too much about China or emerging markets, but look at our own Western Hemisphere. There's quite a bit going on. Indonesia, even, emerging very small country in terms of its economic and uh, the electricity use, but huge. You can look at uh, distributed energy sources that are available. The biggest areas, biggest changes in the next five years or more, although predictions are risky business, but we do put stochastics and getting surveying people and, and being able to synthesize that into what are some clusters, some themes that are emerging. These are the ones, information management, analytics, and leveraging internet of things. Deep understanding of technologies that are needed to be deployed, business impacts of that, and regulatory issues we talked about in the beginning, renewables we all know, storage and resiliency. For fast power start is huge opportunity in that. But is this new? 
I-35W bridge collapsed on August 1, 2007. Do you remember that? My old office for 20 years, at, actually mine was for 10 years over there, faced the Mississippi River and 35W bridge. I witnessed that collapse. And 13 lives were lost, about three dozen people injured, some of them with long-term impacts. And when I went down there, my hat is off to first responders. They were already there helping, saving people. And folks in Minnesota, what you hear about them is correct. They were coming from all over, instead of running away, coming there, helping, rescuing people. Out of that, there is a silver lining. This was the view on the top from my office as that bridge was being built right there. 13 alumni of one of our, my graduate degrees in my institute on infrastructure systems engineering were involved in the reconstruction of the bridge at Minnesota Department of Transportation, public works in the city of Minneapolis, contractor consulting companies. They put sensor networks into that new bridge that gives you vibration, material changes, even closes the loop. On an icy day, you see little jets of the icers spraying out to de-ice the bridge in a proactive way. So the smart bridge that we talk about is already here. Internet of Things is already here when it comes to smart infrastructure. Except it generates so much data, Minnesota Department of Transportation, MinDOT, doesn't know what to do about it. We have great civil engineers, but we need capability to close those loops, harness the data with the analytics. So this is already here. So to conclude, disruption, there are many tools we have. Actually, these are what I work with CTOs, CEOs, VPs, and, and strategists. We can do a variety of things. We do all of them. What are the scenarios? What are the scenarios? How do you have a dashboard that you modify, you track it? Z Prime does a great job on that. Mark uh, some of the reports out of Z Prime. Actually, all of the ones I've read are really outstanding. And I'm not saying it because of my deep appreciation for Z Prime. But at IEEE Smart Grid, I often refer to Z Prime reports and quote them. They're excellent. So these are the areas that can be done. Holistic prototyping also is another one. And what kind of portfolios you have? I think last night Doyle did a great job talking about it. Just to get you thinking about disruption, look at what has happened. This should look familiar. Just from vacuum tubes all the way to smart devices. It took how many years? 70 years? 80 years? If you, by the way, if you normalize it by, by population, internet is not growing any faster than the telephone or television. Did you know that? You divide it by the population at the time that used it. If you don't cheat it, you just put everything on the level, same level playing ground. So the change for us seems huge, but other generations have gone through that and we can do it. And look at what it enables and what these things are gonna enable, these things that we're using today. So, in this conference, we are working with thinkers, with innovators, with amazing people. The dilemma that we have is for incumbent organizations, utilities, how to handle, how to have the courage, the brain power, and the space. A lot of what we hear is actually based on 10 years ago information from some colleagues that are out there. We need to empty our cup, look at the new reality we are in. Otherwise, we are gonna get run over. And I'm being too, too direct because I've heard conversations on some things that really are just myth. They're old thinking. And that's, I hope, what ETS 15, ETS 14 do a good job of looking at these innovations and how to make it possible. So we dig into both of these. And then what are the forces that can hinder or help to move in that area? So what do you do? The solution is actually pretty straightforward. Improve it, add on it, and promote architectural change. We need ambidextrous organizations. You heard last night Doyle talk about adaptive organization. That's exactly what it is. That can align strategy, critical areas with everything. So to conclude, my mom said, Masood, fall asleep because you talk too much. Uh, so always say in conclusion. In conclusion, this is not new. This is something that Wired magazine had said about our work in 2001, and read that. It's pretty straightforward. 
Every node in the power network of the future is awake, responsive, adaptive, price smart, eco-sensitive, and interconnected with everything else. Again, all this, making this a reality, takes leadership. And as Peter Drucker said, only three things happen naturally in organizations. Friction, underperformance, and confusion. Everything else takes leadership. So here's to your leadership and to this great summit to bring us together and to advance progress. Thank you.